Well, we love baptism here at Crossroads Church, and the reason that we love baptism is because baptism is the outward expression of the inward hope that we have in Jesus as believers. And so, if you are a believer here today and you have not been baptized, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, We model it after Jesus' baptism. We see all throughout the New Testament this uh, understanding of when we believe, we get baptized. We believe we get baptized. We believe we get baptized. We, We show publicly our declaration of faith. And so, if If you're here today and you have questions or you're ready to get baptized, we're ready to baptize you. And the easy way to do that is you can simply text NEXT uh, to the number on the screen. And the person on the other side of that line is Doug Schmidt, who is our uh, baptism like guru guy. And if you have questions or need help walking through that process, he's the guy to help you uh, get ultimately to the tank where you make that public uh, uh, declaration. All right. So with that said, I want to welcome all of you joining us online, YouTube, Crossroads Live, as well at our Fort Upton location, and of course, here at Thornton, if we haven't had the privilege of meeting, if you're brand new with us, or uh, maybe somebody invited you, uh, my name is Matt Manning, and I am the senior pastor here at Crossroads Church, and we are in week four of a series where we are walking through the Gospel of Luke, looking at the profound teachings of Jesus. Now, if you've been part of this series, then you'll know that really this series is a series as like a part of a grander series that we've been doing for the last couple of years where we've been taking small chunks of the gospel of Luke and looking at them so that we might understand what it means to know Jesus. Now, when I say know Jesus, oftentimes when we think of that, we think of knowing in different ways. And so let me just kind of explain what I mean when I say no, all right? How many of you recognize this person on the screen right here? Just raise your hand, yeah? Yeah, if you don't know, this is Nikola Jokic, a.k.a. the Joker, and he is the 26th do-all center from Serbia uh, that plays for our Denver Nuggets. Now, pre-COVID, he was a really, really good player. But during COVID, he did something that most of us didn't do. He lost weight instead of gained weight. And he came back into the NBA like as a monster and so good now that he's actually the reigning MVP of the NBA. Yeah, this is, this is like, this guy's a serious player if you haven't watched him yet, all right? So now I could go on and on about the stats when it comes to, to the Joker. I could tell you how he measures up in history. I could tell you some of his greatest attributes. But if I saw Joker on the street and said, hey, Nicola, he'd be like, Who's this guy, right? Because we don't know each other. We don't, we don't have that personal relationship. And that's what this series is all about. We want you to know Jesus. We want you to know who he is and what he was all about so that you can make a decision for yourself if he truly is God. And if that really even needs to matter, if he truly does care for you the way that he says he does, if he really is worth following so that you can make that decision for yourself. And we just really believe that the best way to go about doing that is to open one of the biological accounts of Jesus' life, we call those gospels in the church, and to go through and to see the life of Jesus. And so we've chosen the gospel of Luke, one of those four gospels, and we've been journeying through this for the last couple of years in short segments over the life of Jesus. And as we are picking up the story of Jesus's life in this series, we're about two thirds through Jesus's ministry, his public ministry. He's been at this for about two years. And after two years, he makes this uh, declaration on this mountaintop where he says, I am setting my face upon Jerusalem. Now this was a huge moment in Jesus's life because it's this moment where Jesus definitively decides that he is going to make a march towards Jerusalem in order to go to the crucifixion, in order to be crucified. That this is Jesus deciding that he is going to die for the sins of the world. That's what's happening with, with Jesus here. And so he's on this journey to Jerusalem, and this journey will take about a year for him to accomplish. And as he journeys through this, Luke gives us some of the most profound teachings that we have of Jesus that we find anywhere in the scriptures. And as we make this travel, we get the opportunity, just like the early disciples did, to sit at Jesus' feet and truly learn what it looks like to live, what it truly looks like to to live the life that we've been given by God. And so the the very first lesson that Jesus gives out of this definitive moment as he heads towards Jerusalem is he speaks to and teaches us about the radical cost of following him. That when we follow Jesus, it is the good life, but it is not an easy life. We all need to understand that. It is a good life, but it is not an easy life. That there is a radical cost to following Jesus. 
And as the stories unfold, as Jesus makes his way to Jerusalem, Jesus gives story after story and lesson after lesson about the radical nature of following him. Stories like we saw a couple weeks ago of the Good Samaritan. When the Good Samaritan and and Jesus comes and he tells this story and he says, those who love God with all of their heart and all of their mind and all of their soul and all of their strength, that they look a lot like this Good Samaritan who shows compassion and care to those who are in need rather than the religious people who just walked by because they had something else to do. He speaks of the radical nature and in the story that we saw last week of the rich, uh, the rich man who spends his entire life just gathering possessions. And Jesus, as he shares this story with us, actually gets all up in our grill. He gets all up in our business about our own desires and whether our desires are rightly prioritized in our life. He says, if they are, then your, your, your dreams, your hopes, your desires, they're gonna look radically different when you follow me. This week, today, as we jump into this, we pick up and we sit at the feet of Jesus and we look at another of the radical stories that Jesus shares in the nature of following him. Today, Jesus shares with us a story about a fig tree. And so if you have your Bible, Luke chapter 13 is where we're gonna be. We're gonna be in verse one in just a moment. But as we set up the story, where we pick it up today is that Jesus is traveling again from Galilee in the north to Jerusalem. And somewhere along this path, as he's walking along the path, thousands of people gather around him. In fact, there are so many people gathering around Jesus that they're actually trampling on one another in order to get close to him. And as Jesus is making his way through the crowd toward Jerusalem, people start like shouting out questions to him and Jesus does what he always does. He stops and he begins to ask or answer those questions for them. He begins to teach. And somewhere along the way, as he's teaching to this massive crowd, news starts to spread of a tragic event that's happened through the crowd and eventually it gets to Jesus. This is where we pick up the story, Luke chapter 13, starting in verse one. There were some present in the crowd at the very time who told him about the Galileans who blood, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. So just so you understand, there's thousands of people gathered around Jesus. Jesus is teaching, and, and somewhere in the midst of his teaching, someone yells out and goes, hey Jesus, did you hear about the Galileans? They were down in Jerusalem and, and they were making their sacrifices to God. And all of a sudden, Pilate's army showed up out of nowhere and slaughtered them. And the word on the street is that it was so brutal that their blood mingled with the blood of the sacrifices that they were making to God. Now, as we look at the history books, we don't know exactly when this event occurred or or what this event was speaking to, but we know that this wasn't out of the norm when it comes to Pilate. Pilate was a brutal leader. That Pilate is the governor over Judah during Jesus' life. And Pilate was known for the way that he brutally handled the Jews. In fact, we have stories in the history books of just how brutal Pilate was. That there's this one story of Pilate where he wanted to build an aqueduct, a thing to carry water from the pools of uh, Solomon all the way to Jerusalem. And he decided that the way that he was going to pay for that is by taking from the treasury of the temple, to take from the offerings that were given to God. Well, as you can imagine, the priest and the Jewish people, that they weren't too thrilled that this was going on. And so they put together a pretty large group of people to go to Pilate and to beg for their money to be given back. And as that crowd approached Pilate, Pilate came up with the idea to send his army dressed as as common people into the crowd. And at his moment, at his signal, they threw off their cloaks, pulled out their daggers and slaughtered the entire crowd. I mean, to be a Jew under Pilate's leadership during this time was was just brutal. He was a brutal leader. And Jesus, upon hearing this tragic event, he responds in what only can be described as a very curious question. He looks at the crowd, verse two, and he says this, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? Because they suffered in this way. I mean, come on. This is such a curious response, isn't it? such a curious response to such a tragic event. And yet what Jesus is doing in this moment is he was actually addressing a common belief that people during this time had. 
See, people during this time in this culture believed that good people only had good things happen to them and bad people only had bad things happen to them. That God, as he orchestrated this world, he would see if you were good, that only good would happen to you. And if you were bad, bad things would come upon you. And the popular thought of hearing news like this that would have absolutely been moving through the crowd during this moment is that people, the people, the Galileans who were slaughtered in this way when it came to the way that Pilate handled them, that it must have been because they were really terrible sinners, that somehow, some way, they deserved this kind of death. And unfortunately, unfortunately, this is still a common thought today, isn't it? That this kind of thought is as prevalent today as it was in Jesus's time. That somehow today in our culture and in our time, we think that if we can just like barter with God, If we somehow can just be good, and let's be honest, good is however we define it, that if we can just be good, then God will save us from the asteroids and the terrorists, from the drunk driver, from the suffering and the pain of our lives. And then when tragedy strikes us or someone we love, all of a sudden we all become theologians, don't we? And we ask the question, God, why do do bad things happen to good people? Jesus takes the opportunity to address this way of thinking right here. And before anyone can answer his question, he actually answers it himself, verse three. No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then Jesus brings up another tragic event, verse four. Or are those 18 on whom the tower in Salem fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That Jesus, in in answering his own question, makes the point, not, listen, not that these Galileans were innocent. That's not the point that he's making. The point that, that Jesus is making in this moment is that this terrible death, in these terrible deaths, that these Galileans were simply no more guilty than anyone else. The point that Jesus is making is that God does not separate humanity into categories of good and bad. That's not the way that God operates. In fact, the way that God operates and the way that God moves is that he simply looks at every single one of us as bad. That we're all guilty because of the sins that we've committed in this life. And the real issue before God, at least according to Jesus, is not whether a person is good or bad, but rather or not, whether a person repents or perishes. And I don't know about you, but when I hear those words, repent and perish, this picture is what comes to mind for me. The person standing on a street corner with the sandwich sign, the hell, the fires of hell, and scary words, right, written in scary font, repent or perish. And here's my question. When Jesus is talking to this group upon hearing the tragic news of what happened to the Galileans, is this what he meant? Is this what he meant? See, when it comes to this understanding of of repent or perish, Jesus uses these two words, and the question that we have to ask is, is what did he mean by them? What did he mean by these words? When he spoke them, was was he speaking them in terms of condemnation and judgments? When it comes to our understanding of repentance, is repentance really just simply listing out all of my sins as I pray at night, expressing my sorrow and my regrets, acknowledging that I messed some things up, and promising the best that I can that I'll never do it again? Is that what repentance really is? Does it mean that if I don't say that I'm sorry, that I'm going into the fires of hell? Does it, is repentance just some kind of like divinely sanctioned apology that keeps us from God's judgments? Or is it that repentance is something more? See, the reality is, is that when it comes to this word repentance, it's not a word that we use often in our culture, is it? In fact, we don't even use it all that often in church world. And when we do, we just kind of throw it out there and then we move on like everybody understands it. And yet the reality is, is that many of us don't actually understand what the word repentance means or is. And yet it's so hugely important, isn't it? 
I mean, if, if what Jesus is saying that these are the only two options, repent or die, it's pretty important for us to understand what repentance is. And so when it comes to repentance, the simple definition is this, that repentance simply means to change one's life direction or their course. It means that, that you're walking in this direction and then to say that I've repented is to stop and to make the definitive action to head in the other direction. That's what repentance is. So let me explain it to you like this. Let's suppose that you wanted to become a skydiver. And so you went to skydiving school and they taught you how to pack your parachute and how to pull the ripcord and how to land safely. And your day came when you were going to be taken up in an airplane. And, and so you're in the airplane, you get to like the cruising altitude, 7,000 feet, and the instructor looks at you and says, okay, man, it's your time to jump. And as you make your way to the edge of the plane, you're looking out at the 7,000 feet between you and the earth. And all of a sudden your knees get weak. You feel like you're going to throw up and you think to yourself, I can't do this. And you look at your instructor and you're going, no, <laughs> like, I'm not going to jump. And the instructor says, no, man, you can do it. And as he's like trying to push you out of the door, you're like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to do this. You've just repented. You've just repented. You've changed your life's course. Now, we don't often think of it that way, do we? That's not typically the way we think of repentance. And so today, what if Jesus wants us to see repentance as not just a listing of the sins and saying that we're sorry and that we deserve punishment, but what if it's rather about something that makes all things right by redirecting our entire lives towards the God who is the ultimate source of life. And then in that redirection, in that redirection of our lives that we become radically transformed into something more, something like fig trees. I mean, that's the way that Jesus compares us. Look, verse six. And he, Jesus, in the midst of this teaching, told this parable to the crowd. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the vine dresser, look, for three years now, I've come seeking fruit on this fig tree and I find none, cut it down. Why should I use up any grounds? And the vine dresser answered him, sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and put on manure and then it should bear fruit next year. Well and good, but if not, then you can cut it down. End of story. Okay, so let's, let's just think through this. Thousands of people are around Jesus. Someone shouts from the crowd, hey Jesus, did you hear the tragedy? All of a sudden he takes that opportunity to share that the measure of a person's life, the measure of a human's life is not whether they're good or bad, but rather if they have repented or not. And now he's got all of the crowd's attention just like he has our attention and we're sitting here wondering, we're on the edge of our seats going, uh, uh, Jesus, what does a repented person look like? Because if the option is, is repent or die, I don't want to die, so what does it look like if I'm repentant? What does that look like? And so Jesus launches into this story about a fig tree. Let's just call it what it is. It's bizarre. It's bizarre. See, Jesus coming into this says there's a fig tree. And it's not a particularly good fig tree. It's not bearing any figs. There's no fruit on it. And the person who owns the tree basically says, it's time for this tree to perish. I'm gonna cut it down. But there's another character in the story that Jesus introduces us to, and he's the vine dresser. And the vine dresser goes, no, 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 no. Let's give it some more time. Let's throw some Scott's fertilizer on it. Let's dig around the roots. Let's, let's do some things. Let me work on it. And then I'm confident, I'm confident it will produce fruits. And so the owner goes, all right. Fig tree, you get a stay of execution. We'll come back in one year. End of story, Jesus moves on. And we're like, Jesus, I got some questions, right? Like what does a fig tree have to do with repentance? And Jesus says, well, just about everything. See, Jesus looks at us and he says, I want you to know that just like the fig tree, you don't have as much time as you'd like to think. The owner, who happens to be God in this story, is full of mercy, and he is a patient God, but his patience is not to be presumed upon. And this life is full of tragedy, that this 
life has an immediacy about it, doesn't it? That we live with the truth, every single one of us, that one day our life will be called upon. And in that moment, we will exist no more on this earth. That we will die. That every single one of us lives knowing that there will be a moment in our life when our life ends. I mean, this was so apparent in the story that we looked at last week. If you were here, you remember that we looked at the rich man who spends his entire life accumulating more and more possessions and then building bigger and bigger barns and then his day of reckoning came. On this night, your life will be required of you. In a moment, he's gone. And what he spent his entire life working toward, the accumulation of stuff, no longer matters. See, there will be a day when our lives come to an end. And Jesus goes, on that day, the question before you is not whether you were good or bad, but whether or not you repented. See, when Jesus says repent or perish here, he's actually talking about the process of transformation. That is, how do we become alive in Jesus? What does that look like for us? And it's right here in this story about a fig tree where we begin to understand that repentance isn't just a listing of our sins that we're sorry for, but actually the redirection of our life. Spiritually speaking, it's where we put God first and everything else in our life second. It's the redirection of our desires and our hopes and our dreams, really our entire beings, that results in transformation where we become more like Jesus, more alive in Jesus. And as we become more alive in Jesus, Jesus says that there's a transformational work that happens in us where we begin to bear fruit, fruit that looks a whole lot like the life of Jesus, that this is the answer to the question the crowd is asking. How do we know? How do we know what a repentant person looks like? Jesus says you'll know because your redirection of your life will find fruit, that you will, that you will start bearing fruit. And that in Jesus' words, all he's saying when he says fruit, that's Bible lingo for tangible change. It's when Jesus moves from our plus one to the center of our lives where we're all about him. It's those moments in our life where we look at the sin that used to give us so much pleasure, and then when we, when we do that sin, it only brings heartbreak into our lives. When it comes to our relationships, we start to notice that there's compassion and care instead of harshness. When we're walking through this world, we're no longer indifferent to the legitimate needs that we see all around us. That as we, as we move through the world, we notice that we, we become people who are encouraging rather than constantly tearing down. Our cautious prayers end and our dangerous ones begin. We stop, be, we stop attending church and we start being the church. The redirection of your life will result in transformation with tangible change and you will know, you will know, you will experience what it means to truly live. And that's what this parable in Luke chapter 13 is all about. And yet Jesus gives it to us in such a sobering way, doesn't he? I mean, he looks at every single one of us and he says, if repent, uh, repentance is to truly live, then the opposite of that is death. It's to perish. That is to say that if by chance we refuse to repent, redirecting our lives and submitting our whole lives, our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. If we refuse to repent, Jesus says, then what's the alternative other than to wither and to die? If we depend wholly on ourselves and not at all on God, then what's the other option but to perish? One of my most favorite books that I've ever read is Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. If you've never had the opportunity to pick it up, you should. It's a small book. You can read it in no time at all. But in it, C.S. Lewis says these words. He says, each choice that we make in our lives turns us either towards God or away from God. Every thought, every word, and every deed turns that core 
central part of us into either a heavenly creature or a hellish one. In other words, we are constantly undergoing transformation. God is either shaping us into beautiful people who will one day be at home in heaven because of our repentance, or we are perishing by turning ourselves into dark creatures who will willingly choose hell over being anywhere near Jesus. See, when Jesus says repent or perish, he's not saying it in the form of condemnation or judgment. He's saying it out of mercy. And this is where we start to get the parable a little bit mixed up. Because oftentimes when it comes to this parable, we think that we're the owner with the ax in our hands and that it's our job to go around and find the trees that aren't producing fruits and to begin to take the ax towards them. That that's where we believe our role is. And unfortunately, so many so-called Christians have taken these words of Jesus, repent and perish, and they put it in the context of judgment, and they've pointed it as a weapon towards the LGBT community, towards abortion clinics, towards adulterers and liars and divorcees, towards sinners in the world. And listen, when it comes to the story, we don't actually carry the ax. Jesus says, this ax is not yours because you're not the owner, you're the tree. And Jesus sets up this whole story so that every one of us would understand and see that in God's eyes that we are the barren tree, that we're the bag fig tree not producing fruits, deserving to be cut down, deserving to perish. But the vine dresser comes along and says, you see that tree? You see that Matt Manning tree? Don't cut that one down just yet. Let me do my thing. And all of a sudden, the vine dresser becomes the savior in the story. The vine dresser is the savior of your story. The vine dresser comes in and begins to dig around the roots because the vine dresser says, this isn't a fruit problem, this is a root problem. And I'm gonna dig around the roots, I'm gonna dig around the core of this tree and it's gonna be painful and at times, the tree's gonna wish that I didn't do it, but it's gonna be better. And if the tree allows me to dig at the roots, it will know life. It can be transformed. This tree can bear fruits. And what we all understand, at least at this point, is that the vine dresser is Jesus. And he's looking at you just like he looked at the crowd some 2,000 years later or before. And as he looks at you, He's meeting you in the same place that he met the crowd on that day, not in judgment, but out of great mercy. He says, you need to wake up from the complacency of your life, that life is short and at any moment, God can call you home. And it's not whether you are good or bad, but whether or not if you've repented. And the good news of great mercy today is that if you're here, if you're online, if you can hear my voice, the ax hasn't swung for you yet. That Jesus is there and he's saying to you, you can't do this on your own. You've tried, you've tried to bear fruit, you've tried to make the changes of your life and it doesn't work. You need a vine dresser, you need a savior, you need me, repent. Today, change the direction of your life. So if you're here today, and that's a decision that you wanna make, our engagement team is ready to have that conversation with you. You can simply text the name of Jesus to 720-513-1933. Before we go to communion, will you pray with me? Father, the reality as we look at this parable is that the story gets real very fast. When we all of a sudden realize 
that in any moment, Lord, our day of reckoning can come. And just like that, the life that we know on this earth ceases. And what's next for us is either heaven or hell. And what distinguishes us from going from one or the other is not whether we are good or bad, but rather or not if we have repented. And so, Lord, the reality is, is that we need a Savior every day of our lives. That every single day, Lord, we stand before you, sinful and broken. That we need you rooting around in the core of who we are to transform us, to bring us life. And so, Lord, we cry out to you today. We cry out to you today. Lord, I pray for those who have walked with you for many years. Lord, that we never take for granted, we would never forget what you've done in our lives. That every day our lives would be lives of repentance. Lord, I pray for those who may not yet know you. Lord, I pray that today that they would know, that they would know you, that they would experience you. Lord, that they would choose to walk in your direction. Lord, I pray that, I ask of that, and all of God's people said, amen. Every week here at Crossroads, we celebrate the reality of the repentance that we've been offered by going and doing communion together. The only reason that we're not perishing is because of Jesus, and on that cross where his body was broken and his blood was spilt so that we would have life so that we would have something to run to, someone to run to. This is the reminder that, that Jesus is our savior. And so today, we remind ourselves again of the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf by eating of the bread and drinking of the cup. Today, as we continue on in our worship, uh, we're gonna sing. We're gonna sing some great songs, some old hymns, some new bluegrass. It's gonna be a really good time. At any point during that time, if you're online and you need prayer, we just encourage you to click the button. If you're in-house, you just make your way towards the back. We'll have people to pray there for you. It's a privilege for us to do so, all right? So I'm gonna go invite you, wherever you may be, to go ahead and stand as we sing today.